The largely rural idyll devised by Eamon de Valera to be the new order in Ireland couldn't satisfy the aspirations of all. This Irish stew of Sinn Féin ideology, cultural and economic, was found to be not big enough to feed all, not rich enough for some appetites, too narrow and inward-looking, shunning what might have been enriching outside influence. They drifted from the land to the towns and cities out of need for work and a livelihood or drawn by the gaiety of life they thought they heard from the city. If you didn't inherit the farm, you stayed on sufferance or you left to make your own livelihood in a trade or a family finance permitted in a profession. But local opportunities were few in everything ranging from the priesthood to farm labouring. Emigration was the traditional escape, and by now 43% of all Irish-born people lived abroad. But the depression of the 30s had cut off that channel. By and large, the path to a livelihood led first to the local railway station and to a journey which would mark out the rest of their lives in the towns and the cities. It wasn't that jobs were easy to come by in the cities. Three years after de Valera had come to power and unleashed his energies and vast amounts of public money to get job-creating projects up and running, the frustrating fact was that more and more people were out of work. In just 10 years, the dole queue had doubled to 133,000 people. They scarred the daily newspapers in desperate hope and usually in vain. The lucky few had solid jobs on the roads with the corporation, and now their numbers swelled with the government spending more on roadworks, not so much that they wanted better roads, they desperately wanted more jobs, echoes of famine relief works. But it was a grateful man who got that work with an assured pay packet from the corporation, a pay packet which meant the rent paid, food for a wife and children. And to help employ young women, one Galway priest suggested that the country should double the number of nurses in its hospitals and lower the standard of educational requirement to do it, if needs be. For a young man or woman coming up from the country and without the education or money to gain a foothold in the professions, there was the prospect of a job in one of the big city stores. They became the labour force of major shops like Cleary's, living in company dormitories just a walk away in the Georgian houses of Mountjoy Square segregated, of course, and under the watchful and stern eye of the shop's management, who saw a moral responsibility too. And some who made their way to town and city might bring a dowry with them, and so make a good marriage into a shop business, or with the help of credit from suppliers and an eye to an opportunity, they could start up their own shop. They also turned to the new factories being promoted by Lamas, who had revived the Department of Industry and Commerce, which he said had been rotting from inactivity. Now it had a major task on hand to develop the new factories rising up to give the country the self-sufficiency it wanted in trade insofar as that was possible. The sugar beet processing factories scattered around the country, the new turf burning electricity generation stations, the newly built flour mills, tanneries and engineering factories. And at the official openings, occasional reminders of the other strands of the weave of that new society. Lamas made no pretense. In those hard times, when a frugal sufficiency was seen as the ideal, the priority was to give jobs. Perhaps not well-paid jobs, but jobs. They positioned those factories outside the cities to keep the people as close to the land, to their traditional roots, as possible. Though sometimes the intended beneficiaries of those pay packets seemed less responsive than might have been expected. Outside Dublin and Cork, the country hadn't had any industrial tradition. The only factory might have been the bacon factory or the creamery, where at harvest time the demands of life back on the farm were understood and accepted. Now the very scattering of modern industry around the countryside ensured that an industrial culture could not get a foothold, and that's how the government wanted it to stay. 
But workers who had been brought up on the land with little or no money of their own and used to carefully measured handouts from their father now found themselves financially free by earning even the minimum in the local factory. Managers bemoaned the fact that workers who are paid according to production wouldn't bother working harder or longer to earn more. They often failed to turn up for work on Mondays, recovering from the effects of a weekend sport. They'd go missing if there was a local race meeting and not bother venturing out to make their way to the factory if it happened to be raining. And the bewailing manager, same race meeting, different enclosure. Increasingly, the Irish worker was discovering a new ally and protector in life, the trade union. Membership had gone up dramatically since the First World War. Now, in the years of industry, comfortably settled behind the walls of tariff protection built by de Valera and Le Mas, fortunes were claimed to be amassed by entrepreneurs, fortunate enough to impress the Fianna Fáil government with their case for tariff protection for their factory. The unions weren't blind to this and demanded what they saw as their share. The result was that in the space of a few short years, most Irish factory workers were better paid than their British counterparts. And in leapfrog fashion, employers then claimed that since they had to pay more, they needed yet more protection. And in all this, some saw the devious hand of the British unions, of which many Irish workers were now members. They wanted Irish workers paid to the extent that they couldn't compete against British factories out in the markets. To some extent spurred by political opposition jibes that Irish industry was a hole and corner development and responding to the case put forward by the Irish trade union movement, the government was to introduce laws which would revolutionise the conditions in which Irish labour worked. Le Mans saw the move as giving workers here conditions better than in any other country. And he boasted it was the first time that any democratic government had introduced such measures. They meant that the working week for an adult was to be cut to only 48 hours without loss of pay. Workers were guaranteed one week's paid holiday in the year, as well as six public holidays. They would get extra pay for overtime, and women and young people were barred from nighttime working. No satanic mills in their vision of the new island. The unions and government enjoyed the best of good terms. Both were enthusiastic for the protection of industry, which, said the unions, had brought a wave of hope and vitality into these depressed and apathetic ranks. And they had a shared distaste for the sight of women workers in our factories. Le Mans took powers under which he could restrict the employment of women and juveniles in some industries. He never actually used those powers, but the possibility probably exerted some psychological pressure on employers. He argued that if employment was to be balanced, then certain avenues of work would have to be reserved for men. Few disagreed at the time. Men were the breadwinners. They had to have jobs to support the family, which was the building block of society. Le Mans even toyed with the idea of banning modern machinery, because with it, women might take on men's work in heavier industry. was virtually universal support for favouring men in the workplace. A deputation from Mount Melick to the department to make a case for a new industry for their town was dismayed to be offered a handbag factory. It would mainly employ women. So the Father Murray who led the deputation said they weren't in the least impressed. They wanted jobs for men. And that reflected itself in government efforts to locate particular industries here. One civil servant who was sent to two English tanneries to negotiate for the setting up of an Irish operation couldn't conceal his excitement and enthusiasm in reporting back that one of the tanners employed no women whatever. Even the typing was done by men. That often decided with which company the government chose to do business. The ever-ready battery factory decided to establish an island with government approval after Le Mans had said that he'd allow them charge higher prices than in Britain if they employed men here. Women were thought to be pushing men, the breadwinners of families, out of work and causing poverty. And so even Mrs. Margaret Pertle of the Tailors and Garment Workers Union called on the government to ban women from much of the tailoring trade. 
Few enough women spoke out against the policy, and the Irish Women Workers' Union found little support when they objected. The president of the Irish Trade Union Congress denounced them, asking, do the feminists here want what occurs in certain industrial countries across the water, where the men mind the babies and the women go to the factories? In fact, only one worker in three was a woman, some of them climbing a social stairway which education had provided. They kicked off the mud of the farm to set up tidy little apartments in the big houses of rat mines, which could no longer be kept by one family. They found order and comfort here, based on white-collar jobs in the fledgling civil service, expanding now that we were running our own affairs. And having been raised up in life by the education which their parents had made sacrifices to give them, they passed on that opportunity by becoming teachers in a growing school system. Or there was the demanding but rewarding life of a nurse in our hospitals, even if those hospitals were starved of resources. But those civil service jobs came to an end with marriage. Women had to resign. So a good marriage to secure your place in this better life was crucial. And having tasted the sweeter life of the city, there was no going back. The Saturday night dance in the drafty local hall in the village, policed by the clergy and those lay people who were anxious to parade their piety, that was no match for the screen of the Metropole or Savoy cinemas, where steamy romance blossomed three times a day, entrance three pence. Or the tempo of the jazz in the city ballrooms, with no neighbours watching. Now they had strolled in St. Stephen's Green on their day off. They had watched elegantly dressed ladies idle a hand in the fountain and promenade with gentlemen who had never worked a muddy field and who came home on Friday with a pay packet to a house with electricity and running water. They had a choice to make and they chose city life. And very often a good marriage was the path to that easier life. If you came from a farm or if your people had a shop in the local town or village, you might have a dowry, money to put into a house or better still, a business. A farmer might marry a shopkeeper's daughter and set up their own business. A good move because it brought in your own family's business and their family's business to you. And there were those with secure, privileged jobs in the expanding school system and in the civil service. They would raise large families of seven or eight children out in the new suburbs of red brick houses at Drumcondra and Terenure. Parents who had been raised under thatch, who had run across a bog in summer with a men's lunch, searched for eggs in the hay and picked potatoes, now settled into an ordered city life, removed from the smells, the toil and the hardship of farm life. They had abandoned the little grey home in the west, where in the nationalist dogma, the people of the potato field were somehow more Irish than the Dubliner whose people had made barrels in Guinnesses for three generations. Now they could pose for the family photograph to be sent home to the farm and hand it around the neighbours, proof that they'd made it out of the cultural and economic poverty pit.